For those of you who have been here, you know that this is not original. The story was brought by Randy Frazee um, as a pastor when he went to Oak Hills down in Texas to be with Max Lucado. He had been at Willow Creek, which is one of the largest churches in America. It's in Chicago. In fact, my wife is in Schaumburg, Illinois right now, just outside of where Willow Creek is at. And she was able to go and worship at Willow Creek last night, and Bill Hybels was preaching, who's the founding pastor of that church. It was a church that was founded in a different way, and they said, instead of doing church like everybody else has done, let's meet people at their needs. And out of that, God blessed and blessed and blessed. They understood the community that they lived in and ministered in a way that made sense. And God has blessed them to become one of the largest churches in America. She said, you know, honey, it's funny because several of the songs that we did today at Willow Creek are the same ones that you're doing back at Park. And I'd really rather be back at Park this morning. And so it's been neat to see how God is doing that. Um, when Randy Frazee moved down to Texas and met up with Max Lucado, who's written many books in the Christian world, and they did this series. Randy uh, did the Old Testament part of the story. And so the story is, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, the Bible in the New International Version put into 31 chapters, but it's put in time order. And it doesn't have all the markings of, does this come from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, or where does it come from? There's a chart in the back that tells you chapter and verse, but it just reads like a novel. And so for 21 weeks now, we've been going through this story, starting with creation up to today, which is the end of the Old Testament story. And throughout this, we've been looking at two things. We've been looking at what we call the lower story, which is what happens in the lives of the people that are in the text of the Bible. But we're also looking at the upper story. What has God been telling all of mankind since the beginning? That there really is a grand narrative story that's going on, and we're a part of that today. And so it's been neat to see. What really got my attention was when Randy gave the message for this last one in the Old Testament series, he told a story of a time when he woke up in the morning and his ear was kind of buzzing. And some of you have had that happen before. Things went okay throughout the day, and the next day the same thing happened. And his wife said, well, here, let me put a few drops in, and it stopped. When it happened again, he finally went to the doctor's appointment. When he went to the doctor's appointment, they sprayed water in and put these big tweezers down in there. And can anybody guess what they pulled out of his ear? One of those earwigs. Yes, those disgusting things. Well, it just so happened that yesterday I found one of those things. And as I laid down last night, my mind started to play tricks on me that my ear was itching. Randy used that as an illustration and say, if anything, this is the time for God to get your ear. Jesus would often say as he was preaching to the crowds, those who have ears to hear, let him hear. And I love the text that we're looking at this morning because for any church who's thinking about a building project, this is where a pastor goes at just the right time. So this is a little bit in advance. Many of you know we've been talking about doing some reconstruction here at Park. And we've been talking about it, in essence, for years, quite a bit in the last year. And we are working on plans for that. They're not quite ready yet, as we want to do the right thing in God's perfect timing. But as you get into the story this morning... We cross into the final of the three phases of God's people returning from exile. If we go through the Old Testament story all the way through, we know that God's people had turned from him time and time and time again. They would follow for a little bit, turn away, follow, turn away, follow, turn away. Round and round they went. Until God said to the northern kingdom, you're done. And they were hauled off by the Assyrians. And in the southern kingdom of Judah, they were hauled off by the Babylonians. And during that 70 years of exile, while they were there, hauled off in three waves, three waves or three phases, the Babylonians were taken over, and eventually they were allowed to begin coming back. The Persians were the ones who were in control at this point, 
And we remember that during the first wave, under Zerubbabel, 50,000 of the Israelites were allowed to come back to Jerusalem to build the temple. Remember, the temple had been totally destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar's forces. The walls, everything in Jerusalem had been burned and destroyed. We talked about how they came back and there was a period of time where they began building with earnest and they got the foundation for the altar done and they began to sacrifice again and to worship. And it was great and they went back the next day and started building the foundations for the, wall, for the temple. And, and by about six years in, nobody was coming back and it kind of sat there for ten years. Now, I've traveled on mission trips to Mexico and South America, and I know what it looks like to see a building that's partway under construction because that's all the money you had, and then you stopped and you wait until someday when there's money again. And I kind of get that visual picture of what it was like to have the foundation set for the temple, but nothing happening. And then God used a messenger again to convey to the people how important it was because the temple was a symbol of who God is. And so they continued. Next up, we get under Ezra, the priest, who comes back and begins to teach the people repentance. If God had one really important rule, way, way, way back when he told Abraham, I'm going to take you into a place, I'm going to make you a blessing to the other nations, if there was one rule they really, really should have followed, it was this. Don't intermarry with the other people because they will draw you away from me. In the way that they worship other foreign gods who aren't really gods, the way that they worship through idols, don't do that. And God's people, again, were doing that. And that was the primary objective of Ezra as he was allowed to come back to teach the people again, this is what God said. This is why we're not to intermarry. It's because they will draw you away because of the foreign gods that they worship. So what do we get with Ezra? Well, Ezra has an interesting description. If you turn your stories open to chapter 21, it says, During the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, son of, and then a whole bunch of names. But near the end of the line, it says, The son of Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. Direct descendant of the first high priest in Aaron, Moses' brother. This guy's got a direct line back, and he knows exactly where his family line goes. And it says, This Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher well-versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted him everything he asked, for the hand of the Lord, was his God, was on him. And I put that in blue on the screen to make sure you highlight it. Open up your stories if you've got them, and I want you to highlight or underline that. It's at the bottom of... Chapter 21, the first page there, is page 291. For the hand of the Lord his God was on him. How do you know that? How do you know when the hand of the Lord your God is on you? Well, not only do you see it, but everybody else does as well. We get a picture of that in several descriptions throughout the Old Testament as we looked at folks. Like Joseph, who his brothers had sold into slavery. Way, 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 way back in the early weeks of the story. Remember him? The hand of the Lord was upon him, and everywhere he went, every place that he touched was blessed. And whether he was in his master's house, whether he was in the prison, wherever he was at, the way that he lived, God blessed all that was around him. And that's the description we get of Ezra. That here was one who was well-versed in the law of Moses, the king granted him everything he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. If you turn the page, we see about the people who begin to go back with him. On top of 292, it says that he arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh year, the king. He had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month. It gives you pictures. We've been drawing that map back and forth in the front of your stories. From where he was at in Babylon, it's a four-month journey to get back to Jerusalem. It's not like you just hop in a plane and you're there in 20 minutes. It's not like you hop in a car or ride a train. It's a grueling four-month journey 
to get there across the desert. You've got to be pretty intentional about getting there to begin making step one to get there. And it says here again, because of the hand of the Lord my God was on me, I took courage and gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. In between that, there's this letter that the king had written to Ezra to take back with him. Ezra said, oh king, I think I need to go back. And the king says, well here, go. Be blessed in that. To all the leaders around that you travel through, these people may not be taxed. In fact, give them everything that they need. Ezra, make sure when you get there that you've taken enough money to be able to buy all the bulls and the sheep and the whatever else you need to offer sacrifices to your God. Again, here's this really weird picture of a foreign king who begins to get an understanding of who Almighty God is. It's the picture that had come back, that God had given way back in the beginning to Abraham. You're to be a blessing to the other nations. You're to be a light of who I am. And foreign kings began to get it. What a neat time. He goes back. And it says that he took courage and gathered the leading men from Israel to go up with him. And he went back. Ezra made the difficult trip back. If you're on page 294 and you look down in the stuff in italics, which is the author's interpretation of what happened in between, it says that Ezra tore his clothes in grief and wept as he prayed, confessing the people's sin and asking for God's mercy. Convicted by Ezra's display of remorse, the people of Jerusalem repented. As their leader, he conveyed to them how significant this sin was against God. That he commanded them, don't intermarry. And it's, please don't confuse it with intermarriage today between whites and blacks and Hispanics. That's not what we're talking about here at all. Some have totally confused this and have misrepresented God in terrible ways. God said, don't intermarry with these people specifically because they worship other gods. And they will draw you away from me. Time and time again, we've looked at that through the Old Testament story. That was his reason for telling them, don't intermarry with them. You're to remain separate from me and be an example. It says there, 13 years later, we meet the next guy. Under Ezra the priest, there was repentance that happened. The next guy we meet is this guy named Nehemiah. And on 295, we begin to get the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah gets a story from one who has come back, who's made the four-month journey back from Jerusalem, and reports to him, how are things going? He's the chief cupbearer for the king. He's a man that's got access to the king. He's got the highest security clearance. He gets all the good stuff, hopes that it's never been poisoned, because if it is, he's the one that's going to die first. It's a pretty cushy job unless somebody's out to get the king. And when he finds out that they have rebuilt the temple, which is great, there's worship that's going on, there's repentance that's going on, people are turning back to God, but there's a problem. The wall around the city of Jerusalem still lies in ruins. It's kind of like if you open the store, put all the gold in the front window, leave the door wide open and leave for a few weeks and never lock the door. Hey, everybody, come on in. Take a look. It's yours to take. Without a wall around the city, they're open and inviting to invaders at any time they would choose. And Nehemiah says, we can't leave it like that. If you learn anything else about Nehemiah as a leader, he is a leader who prays. Nehemiah does... Nothing on his own without seeking God's direction first. We see it over and over and over again. Verse 4 of Nehemiah. There's only three verses before this, and we learned that this is the thing to know about Nehemiah. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah knew something had to be done, but... What? And let me just tell you this. 
When you know something needs to be done in your life, but you don't know what, Nehemiah gives us the example. It says, for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And when Nehemiah knew the right thing to do, he took courage and acted. You see, it's one thing to know what you should do. It's one thing to know what God's word says. It's a whole different thing to actually do it. To take the courage to go where God calls us to go. And Nehemiah did. Nehemiah went before the king, and the king blessed him and said, go. Nehemiah went with a group of people to go back and to scope out things. Now, the interesting thing is, Nehemiah didn't tell everybody first what he was going to do. Nehemiah went on his own, took just a few trusted men, and at night went and scoped out the city. He went around to see what needed to be done and prayed about it. When he had scoped it out and figured out what needs to be done, look at the words that come. Then I said to them, or all the people who were there, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. When Nehemiah called them to action, which was dangerous work, the people said, let's do it. Let's not leave this place lying around in disgrace any longer. Let's get involved in what God wants to do. Let's get involved in being a part of showing the other nations how great our God is. And they got busy. Now, the thing that always happens is when we start getting busy about doing God's work, there's always opposition. You can just bank on that. As Nehemiah got started, other people took notice. And people came and tried to dissuade them and tell them it's never going to work. But chapter 4, verse 6 of Nehemiah, on 297 in your stories, says, So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. Can I just tell you there's no other way it would have happened? There's no other way that the people would have gotten that far in the progress with all the opposition that was already happening unless they had been working at it with all their heart. I don't know about some of the projects you've started, but if we half-heartedly go about it, it's pretty easy, just like we talked about a few weeks ago, to kind of put it on the shelf. Maybe someday. Maybe someday. And that's how it began with rebuilding the temple. Oh, this is great, but hey, you need help putting a porch on? I can do that. Hey, you need help with your roof? I can work with that. You come over, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And the, the what? The, tem the temple? They'd forgotten about it. When Nehemiah came back and told them, this is what we need to do in honor of our God, the people worked at it with all of their hearts. And so the opposition continued. As the opposition continued and continued, we get those great guys, Sanballat and Tobiah. You've probably heard the story before. We see a prayer on top of page 297 of just how Nehemiah prayed. It says, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. The reason I like that prayer so much is because sometimes we sanitize our prayers a little too much before God. We figured that just wouldn't sound right if I said it that way. I've got to clean it up. Somebody else might be listening. Somebody else might read what's on my connection card. 
So I'm going to clean it up a little bit too much. And Nehemiah just prayed what was really on his heart. If you go back and you read through the Psalms, that's the thing that David did. Some of you have been taught that to revere God and know that he is holy means you can never say the truth to him. I mean, it sounds weird to say it that way, but you've been taught that you can't be honest with God about how you're really feeling. Nehemiah said, Lord, this is how I'm feeling about all that they're doing to oppose you and us and the people you've called to do the work that you've called us to do. And Nehemiah just put it right out there before God. He didn't try to candy coat or anything. He said, this is, this is where I'm at, Lord. Some of us need to be a little more honest in our prayers with God. They had rebuilt the wall till it was halfway there. and Oh, then the real difficulty came. Because they realized just idle threats from afar weren't working. And so those who opposed what they were doing got a little more serious. So what does Nehemiah do? But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Why do I highlight and? Because sometimes we do that. We do the first part and we may pray, Lord, this is really tough. Will you take care of this for me completely while I sit here? While I sit here? And Nehemiah knew what to do. God had said, protect yourselves. God gives us a wisdom to know what to do. And not only did they pray to God, but they posted a guard day and night to meet the threat. And so they continued. They continued to face opposition. They continued. My favorite verse in all of Nehemiah. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Nehemiah, as a leader, had a capacity to remind people of just why they were doing what they were doing. Why the struggles they were facing were worth struggling. That there is an enemy, but oh, there is a great God. And you've got wives and children to fight for. So they did. And as we continue on through Nehemiah and the struggles continue, they send messengers over and over to say, hey, Nehemiah, you got to come over here. we, we got to talk about this thing that you're doing. And Nehemiah could see through it. And I love this. Nehemiah says, so I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? For some of you, that's the message that you need right now. You are working hard to serve the Lord. He has called you to something great, and you know it, and you're actively engaged in it. And it seems like everywhere you look, somebody's trying to get you to stop. Somebody's trying to distract you and say, that's not really what God wanted. That's, that's too much. God only wants you to go this far. For some of you, as you're trying to serve God, there are people all around who are just nagging and trying to get you to quit. And Nehemiah has these words that just say, you know what? God has called me to something great. And I don't have time to come down and argue over it with you. I'm just going to stay right here doing the thing that God has called me to do, whether you like it or not. Because I'm not answerable to you, or you, or you. I'm answerable to Almighty God, and I'm doing the thing that He has called me to do. I don't have time for all your busy work. I don't have time for all your nagging. Some of you, those are the words of assurance you need to know right now to be engaged in the call that God has got in your life and to not get bothered by anybody else who's trying to detract you from doing what God has called only you to do. So they complete the work. If 
you know the story of Nehemiah, if you've read the chapter, it says in 52 days, they completed rebuilding the wall. Through threats, through danger, through all kinds of opposition, they stayed at it. And at a remarkable time, rebuilt the wall up to defend the city. And the problem is, you're only through chapter 6 at that point. And Nehemiah is what, 15 chapters long? And too many people stop at that point and say, Yay, they built the wall! And we miss the best part of the story of Nehemiah. Now, let me fast forward a little bit. There's a verse that I love out of James. James says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And the reason I put that up on the screen is because we begin to see God's people living that out. There's an awesome thing that happens here at the end of Nehemiah, and I want to share it with you. If you haven't got your stories open, it's Nehemiah chapter 8. And it goes a little something like this. It says, All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. In other words, kids who were old enough to get it were there. Men and women had come out to hear Ezra read from the book of the law. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. There's a little break in your story there. That's the end of verse 3. Verse 4 lists all the people who were there as leaders who were out in the crowd to help interpret it. See, the problem is through all these years, the people didn't understand Hebrew anymore. They had been gone in captivity. They had learned the new languages. And as Ezra reads from the book of the law in Hebrew, they need help understanding it. And so there are men dispersed out there to help interpret and explain what does God's law mean. And they're out there from morning till noon, standing and listening and absorbing every word that's being said. The next thing is chapter 8, verse 5, Nehemiah. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them, and as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen! Amen! Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. What a picture. Some wonder why we raise hands. Some wonder why some people in churches shout Amen. Because it's been done for a long time. It's a way of worshiping God. They stood and they raised their hands and they said, Amen and Amen. They were excited about what God was doing. They were excited to learn about God's love for them through the law. They were excited to learn about what does it mean to have a relationship with our Creator. What does it mean that He's called us as His holy people to be an example to the nations around us? They were excited. Then there were a list of Levites there. And they read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. If you want to underline that, it's one of my favorite things I've underlined in my Bible. Making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Folks, as they began to understand what God's holy standard was and realizing how far apart from that they had been living, they couldn't help but weep and mourn. And repentance crying out to God saying, Forgive us. We didn't know. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to the Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. 
Then all the people went away to eat and drink and to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. That's the first day. By the end of the first day, they are going out united and celebrating because of great joy and beginning to understand. You can't read all of the book of the law, just so you know, from daybreak until noon. Some of you have been part of that as we were reading out in front of the courthouse earlier this year. You know how long it takes. They would have gotten most of the way through Genesis by that point. They got a part way through Exodus. They wouldn't have gotten into all of the laws yet. But they would have heard their great story of what God has done. Now, if you stop and you think about this, you know their great story. If you've been here week after week after week, you know that when we began in Genesis 1 and 2 at the very beginning of the story, God created this perfect world in seven days. And he created throughout Genesis 1 and into chapter 2. We read about God creating all of the things in order, with purpose. And when God created mankind and placed him on the earth, he looked and he said it was very good and he rested. And then we read about the fall in chapter 3. We read that mankind decided... I don't really want to follow all of God's rules. I want to go my own way. And from the rest, from that moment until what we're reading right here, the rest of the story of the Old Testament is about the lengths that God will go to restore our relationship with us. He loves us. That is the upper story. God wants to return things back to the way it was in the beginning when it says that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day in the garden. That is what God wants to do with us as his people today. He wants to be able to walk with us, but sin separates us from him. We've looked at all of the attempts throughout the Old Testament to try to restore that relationship, whether it was with Noah, the most righteous man that there was, who still sinned. Nobody could fill the gap that separated us from God. And next week, we look at the one who did. We look at Jesus Christ and why his life and death and resurrection makes such a difference. Through all, all of this, God has given his people a set of rules about how to be in relationship with him. That when they have sinned, when they have gone away from him, what the sacrificial system meant as a way to cover sin, in anticipation of the one who would come one day to wash that sin away. That is the Messiah they have been waiting for in Jesus Christ. That's what the rest of the Old Testament has all been about. Is as people have followed him and turned away and back and forth and back and forth. When they have sought an earthly king to be over them instead of their heavenly father, and seen the results of that. That is the Old Testament story. God's great love for us. But it doesn't stop there. Next week we begin the New Testament. And it says that on the second day, as Ezra is there and the people come back, he begins to read the word to them again. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the teacher to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make temporary shelters as it is written. Now, if you looked at how we started this, it said in the seventh month, on the first day, Ezra began reading. And when they got to this point, what did they do? They do. It says that this is what God's people were to do. So what do they do? They do. And they go out and they begin cutting down branches and they make temporary shelters and they celebrate for the next seven days just as they had been commanded. It's been 140 years since the people have been together to do this. And they're so excited by what they're reading about this relationship with God as their heavenly Father that loves them that they go out and do the things as Ezra is reading them. They're excited about this Worship of this God and what it means to be back in a right relationship with him. So the people went out and brought back branches and built temporary shelters for themselves on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate, 
and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this. And their joy was very great. You should underline that. You see, for them, worshiping God wasn't about burden. It wasn't about how difficult is this. It says their joy was very great. They celebrated who God was. And it says day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulations, there was an assembly. The last part of the chapter I'm not going to read this morning. It's from the book of Malachi. And it's sad that it has to come like this, because it says in the book of Malachi that the people had been following and turned away again. During this time of great celebration and joy, they once again turn away, and God says, you're robbing me. The one verse I'll put up is this, Malachi 3.10. It's the only place in the Bible where God says, put me as God to the test. God says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. And there have been many a pastor who have twisted what this means to teach a gospel of prosperity that says you can put God under your finger if you'll just bring enough money in today. And God will do whatever you want. And that's not what this verse says. What this verse does say is that God is holy and loving and he won't settle for second place. He won't settle for our leftovers, our scraps, our stuff we want to take out to the yard sale. God desires first place in our lives. And he knows that the one place to test that most is with your greenbacks, your hard-earned money. That in this, if you will trust him with what he has required, and he says, I love you, and I will bless your socks off. And too many a believer in Jesus as Lord have not believed this verse. It's not about how can I get God under my thumb, but how can I get in his hand? and experience the blessing of knowing him in ways I've never experienced before. So this morning, I challenge you with that. And in the days and weeks to come, would you accept that challenge and that promise that God has given? That his desire is to bless you more than you can imagine. And we're going to read about that beginning next week, about the way that Jesus taught and lived. This morning, Archer's going to come up in just a moment, and they're going to collect our tithes and offerings. They're going to collect our connection cards, and we're going to sing about how great God is and the promise that we are never alone. Would you pray with me? Father, today I do give you praise that your word is a foundation for us. Jesus, that you are a cornerstone for our lives, and that in this verse we see the great promise. Lord Jesus, we know that you came. We know John 3.16 says that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And many have claimed that in their lives. And they said, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. But they may be missing out on true joy. Lord, I thank you that as the people read your word, they heard it read aloud to them, and they began to understand it, they acted. And they did the things that you had called them to do, and they were full of great joy. Father, help us to be filled with great joy, that we would experience the blessings that you want to pour out on us in abundance by being obedient to you. Father, you know that we do not call this out very often in this church. But Lord, in this time, we need to be men and women of faith who act according to your word, that we need to go where you call us to go and share the news the way that you've called us to share. 
We live in a community that, Lord, is turning more and more away from you. So, Father, help us to be your hands and feet as you bless, Lord, through your people and we use wisdom and how to use your resources to reach the most people that we can. God, would you guide us? Would your hand be upon us? Would your spirit be in us as you've promised? I pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.